The year is 1960, and while heading over the Atlantic Ocean, your plane crashes. As you struggle to stay afloat, you see something in the distance, a massive lighthouse in an otherwise endless ocean. With your options dwindling, you have no choice but to swim for it, and inside you spot a bathysphere terminal, and it's here where your journey begins. In 2007, Irrational Games released Bioshock, the story of one man's journey as he struggles to survive in the underwater city of Rapture. Borrowing elements of survival horror and role-playing games, Bioshock broke new grounds with its immersive environment, unique gameplay, and detailed world-building. In August of 2010, Irrational released the first trailer for what would become Bioshock Infinite, and as a gamer seeing this for the first time, I was overcome with awe watching this. Dumbstruck by the idea of Columbia, a city above the clouds, players would no longer be confined to the tight, narrow corridors of Rapture, but rather the seemingly boundless expanse that Columbia presents. Finally, Bioshock fans would be getting the true sequel they've been waiting for. But as the months dragged on and the game was ever more delayed, I slowly became obsessed watching these trailers and demos over and over again. And really when I got right down to it, my obsession boiled down to one simple question. Could Columbia exist? Now when I say exist, I don't simply mean is it possible to build a city capable of sustaining flight long term, but is it possible for humans to survive and not just survive, but thrive? in a city above the clouds. What would your quality of life be? What would you have to sacrifice? And what, if anything, could you hope to gain from living in such an environment? So what better way to start the series than by asking the most basic question of all? Could humans survive at such high altitudes long term? According to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the most basic necessities of life begin at the psychological level. This includes food, water, sex, sleep, homeostasis, excretion, and of course, breathing. The human body is an amazing machine capable of achieving some astounding feats. For instance, in August 1895, Englishman Matthew Webb became the first person in recorded history to swim across the English Channel without the use of artificial aids, swimming from Dover, England to Calais, France in less than 22 hours. More recently, Jamaican Olympian Usain Bolt broke his own record in 2009, clocking 100 meters in 9.58 seconds. But athletes aren't the only ones testing the limits of the human body. On October 14, 2012, Austrian skydiver Felix Baumgartner set the world record for skydiving from the stratosphere, plummeting to Earth from over 127,000 feet. Not only did he break the world record for the highest freefall, but he also broke the record for the highest manned balloon flight, as well as becoming the first human to break the sound barrier. And when you consider the physical toll this takes on the human body, it makes the fact that Felix survived this trip that much more amazing. As you no doubt remember from science class, we inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. This process is known as respiration, and it's the most basic necessity for sustaining life, at least in mammals. If we look at various scenes in Bioshock Infinite, we know that Columbia takes place roughly on, or in some cases, above the clouds. This layer of the atmosphere is known as the troposphere, and while it's impossible to determine how far off the ground any given cloud is, the lowest level clouds, either stratus or cumulus clouds, appear at roughly 6,500 feet, or 1.2 miles from ground level. Now why is this important? Well, it's important because the higher we go up in altitude, the less oxygen there is. See, even though we need oxygen to live, the air we breathe is actually a collection of various gases, but even subtle changes in this mixture can have drastic effects on the body, and the less oxygen we have, the harder it is to breathe. It's the reason why airplanes need to maintain cabin pressure to ensure a comfortable flight, or why hikers need oxygen tanks while scaling tall mountains. But how much can our bodies handle when it comes to a lack of oxygen, and at what height will symptoms begin to present themselves? The most common illness when reaching high altitudes is hypoxia. This happens when the low pressure of oxygen reduces oxygen tension in the lungs, and subsequently the brain, leading to sluggish thinking, dimmed vision, and an eventual loss of consciousness. These symptoms may begin as low as 5,000 feet, even though most people can tolerate altitudes as high as 8,000 feet. At this altitude, there's about 25% less oxygen than at sea level. Other symptoms include hyperventilation, better known as altitude sickness. This is the body's most common response to hypoxia, as a result of partially restoring the pressure of oxygen in the blood, which unfortunately causes carbon dioxide to form, leading to such symptoms as headaches, fatigue, nausea, sleeplessness, and in some cases, pulmonary edema. But we're not talking about climbing a mountain with oxygen tanks, or flying comfortably in an airplane for a couple of hours. We're talking about long-term sustainability, 
walking around in the open air without the use of oxygen masks or pressurization devices. Believe it or not, it's possible to condition your lungs to tolerate various air pressures. Take free diving for example, a form of underwater diving that intentionally does not involve the use of scuba gear, but rather relies on a diver's ability to hold his or her breath until resurfacing. In this video, William Truebridge broke the record for unassisted freediving with a dive of 288 feet in three and a half minutes. But you don't need a lot of practice in order to train your lungs. See, when we exercise, our bodies need more oxygen to feed the muscles as they work harder. The body responds by breathing more quickly and deeply. As the cells in the muscles use up more oxygen, the lungs have to work harder to keep up the supply. The respiratory system then speeds up to supply the oxygen, but also to get rid of the carbon dioxide. Over time, exercising can help our chest cavity get bigger, increasing the amount of air we can take in. More capillaries form around the air sacs, so the body gets better at swapping oxygen and carbon dioxide gases. And like any muscle in the body, the more you work it, the tougher it gets, and therefore, the easier it is to breathe. But if you're born into such an environment, then that's a whole different story because it's possible for your body to adapt to harsh conditions over time. This process is known as adaptation. Take for example the lower regions of the Himalayas which typically clock in at a surprising 15,000 feet above sea level. Studies have found that these populations have ways of compensating for the lower oxygen levels. Compared with acclimatized newcomers, native Andean and Himalayan populations have better oxygenation at birth in large lung volumes throughout life, and generally a higher capacity for exercise. Full acclimatization, however, requires days or even weeks to compensate for the difference. This can be achieved when the increase of red blood cells reaches a plateau and stops, and it can be approximated by multiplying the altitude in kilometers by 11.4. For example, if you wanted to calculate how long it would take to adapt to a height of 13,000 feet, we simply take that height in kilometers and multiply it by 11.4 giving us an answer of approximately 45.6 days. So if we take the lowest point at which Columbia can travel in the clouds, approximately 6,500 feet or 1.98 kilometers, and multiply it by 11.4, we can estimate that it would take the average person, assuming they're in good health, roughly a minimum of 22.57 days to fully acclimate to the conditions of Columbia, at least at its lowest point. So now that we know it's possible for humans to live at such high altitudes, we have to ask ourselves just how comfortable such a lifestyle would be. What sacrifices would we have to make for that comfort? And just what unexpected surprises can we expect from living in such an environment? Stay tuned to part two where we further explore the living conditions of Columbia. Thanks for watching.